All right. So we still have people rolling in. So I think I'll probably, I know that we want to start as close to you on time as possible. So I'll go ahead and get my spiel over with if you guys are okay to start. Sure. Yes. All right. Fabulous. So thank you everyone for coming um, and joining us. We're not at the Hermosa Beach Museum, but we are with it in spirit. Actually, I'm coming to you from El Segundo. Corinne is coming to you from Manhattan Beach, and Ricardo is coming to you from Hermosa. So we have a good representation, and I'm sure there's someone out there coming to us from Redondo. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Having said that, it is our first webinar, so if we have any tech difficulties, I appreciate all of your patience in advance. If you have any problems that you need some help with, you can always shoot us an email at hermosabeachmuseum at gmail.com and we will try to help you out. And that goes for if you have any issues with the Q&A after, you can send them on over there if that's easier for you. So I hope that everybody who's tuning in with us is doing well and that you are all safe at home. And, you know, it's just really been a phenomenal start to 2020. Um, this has really kind of presented everyone, willing or not, the opportunity to kind of change how we do things and figure out how to do things differently. Um, we are currently reimagining most of how we're kind of living our daily lives both at, both at work, at home, and with our family. So having said that, this has really had some tremendous impact oh. on the museum. We've had to cancel so many of our fundraising events, so if any of you are able to support us, you know, high five us for this webinar and donate five bucks, that's really awesome. You can do that on our website. We appreciate that support. So, as of last week, indoor museums were technically allowed to reopen. However, while we have moved into stage three, the Hermosa Beach Historical Society Board of Directors, under an abundance of caution, will remain closed. We are currently developing a safe reopening plan. Our highest priority is the safety of our staff, volunteers, and guests during this time. So our time frame is that we are hopefully shooting for mid-July, but as you both know, as you both and everybody else listening know things kind of change on the daily basis. So in the meantime, thank you so much for joining us for our online presentations. We're going to continue to do this monthly and you can also check out our cool online exhibitions on our website. Does that sound like a good spiel, Ricardo? Did I kind of hit all the points that I right. needed to? Yeah. Awesome. Good. Excellent. Perfect. <laughs> then I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you to introduce Corinne to everybody. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Um, before I came out west um, from, from Chicago to California in the 1960s, I was always enchanted by the hit song, 26 miles across the <laughs> sea, Cattle, Catalina, Fat Santa Catalina is a waiting for me. Um, the pontoon airboats and everything that we could see on posters, etc. And the island became part of my dream, which came true. Um, however, uh, after going to Catalina a couple of times, uh, it took me really a lot of years until just a few years ago when I ventured out to Santa Cruz on a day trip with my grandson and we were exposed to a bit of history and the unique wildlife that's there. So um, there is a lot to learn about the treasure that we have right off our coast and we have the perfect guest lecture to take us on that journey tonight. Um, Perrine, uh, uh, Haining um, Laver uh, Laverty found the island so fascinating and irresistible to explore. Uh, after years as a banker, um, she followed her heart and became a research associate and fellow at the Nat Natural History Museum in, in Los Angeles. Prior to that time, she'd been involved in, in the um, uh, American Cetacean Cetacean Society, um, where she was president and associate of the uh, Santa Cruz Island Foundation and a board member of the Aquarium of the Pacific, where she actually met her first husband, John. Well, we'll talk about him in a moment. Um, so she's been very involved, uh, even while she was in her banking years, uh, with, uh, the, with the coast, with history, with, with uh, uh, with the islands. Um, so um, she then, um, after um, John's um, death, uh, became uh, very involved and, and interested in pursuing, um, as an extended career, 
um, uh, a writer about um, about the coast and particularly the islands. So um, I, I was also impressed to find out that she was a member of the All Eight Club, which is very special because it's an honor reserved to the few people who have actually gone to all eight of the Channel Islands. Um, Green had previously been published uh, various articles in the Lonely Planet, the Echo Traveler, Whale Watcher, Pacific Currents, and other uh, magazines. Um, but she wanted to really delve into something in, in detail. So she moved on to prepare um, the book that, uh, that we have now. Um, she, you may have recognized uh, Corrine's middle name, uh, Haining, because it's from her uh, marriage to John Haining, who is a, a marine biologist and widely, widely, wide, widely known as the whale man in all of the South, south uh, Coast area. Um, Corrine and John lived in Hermosa on Bayview Drive for many years. Um, uh, my mes best memory of him and maybe uh, some of the rest of you who are listening to uh, is one morning um, when he rec uh, received a tip from the lifeguard that there was um, a dolphin, a dead dolphin uh, down on our Hermosa Beach. And of course he ran down to uh, pick it up and <laughs> he didn't have his truck, I guess, with him at the moment. So um, he, he had it in a bag and he was dragging it up Monterey when an anxious neighbor um, reported it to police because they thought there was a man dragging a dead body uh, up through the streets of Hermosa. <laughs> Well, by the time the police arrived on the scene, uh, John had already uh, was already en route to uh, the Natural History Museum with the dolphin uh, in tow um, for dissection. So uh, that was just another busy day for the Hennings in, in Hermosa at, at that time. Um, so uh, um, we're really excited that Corrine is with us tonight. Uh, and it's wonderful to have somebody who has a, a history with us in Hermosa in the past and it gives, gives me great pleasure to introduce her as the extraordinary author of a really extraordinary book. So um, here you have Corrine Haining Laverty. Thanks. Oh, Ricardo, thank you so much for that warm introduction. That was really sweet. That story did make our Christmas card one year. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am truly, truly pleased to be here. You know, Hermosa is my heart home city and uh, love all, everything Hermosa. So thank you for having me. Now tonight we are going to be discussing the Channel Islands and the first inhabitants of these islands were the island Chumash and island Tongva peoples. So I hope that everyone on the call tonight will join me in extending our respect and gratitude to these original caretakers for their stewardship and conservation of the islands. Let's see. Now, this book recounts the never before told adventures and ambitions of a group of researchers, naturalists, and explorers who came together in the late 1930s to embark upon a series of unprecedented expeditions. Their mission, to piece together the human history and biological evolution of California's eight channel islands. Now there's a couple things about this survey that made it really unique. First of all, it was launched by the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, which we know today as NHM. Then it was called the Los Angeles County Museum of History, Science and Art. Of course, we know art broke off and they became two different museums. But the thing about this survey that lasted from 1939 to 1941 was that it had the survey had a eight island focus and a multidisciplinary approach so it, it involved all of the sciences sciences and this had never been done before and i will tell you it has never been replicated so that is a pretty standout achievement now, before we dive into the narrative of the book itself, but this is a story that has never been told before, I think it would help us all to get to know the islands a little bit together, because I know that some of you probably have a little bit more um, knowledge about the islands than others, and it would just be great for us all to, to know them together. Let me just close this here. All right, so let's start 
let me see, with a map. Oh, so I'm sorry, here's a, here, they cut this in stone on San Clemente Island. That was the first island they visited. And I think this is such a beautiful memorial, although I've been told it has been removed <laughs> by the Navy. But anyway, let's start with a map. So here they are, California's eight channel islands lying within the Southern California Bight like giant paint splatters on a Google Earth size Jackson Pollock canvas. Now the islands didn't always look this way. In fact, millions of years ago, they lay on the seafloor submerged beneath the ocean's surface near present day San Diego, right about here. And then through really complicated geology and plate tectonics, some of these rocks were dragged as much as 150 miles northward and rotated as much as 180 degrees clockwise. And then about 2 million years ago, they began rising out of the ocean in roughly the configuration that they are today. However, uh, at, initially, the four channel, northern channel islands, this is Anacapa, Santa Cruz, Santa Rosa, and San Miguel, it's sort of these little brown splotches, were one island, which this blue outline shows you what the, uh, that island, the size of that island. It was called Santa Rosa, or is called Santa Rosa, and it was 76% larger than the combined landmass of the islands today. And it was much closer to the mainland than the islands are today. So this again here, this blue up line is the old mainland shoreline, whereas this kind of beige um, color is the current sh shoreline. So you can see they were only about five miles away. Now, as you might imagine, this would have affected the kinds of plants and animals that were on these islands because First of all, these islands were never attached to any terra firma that could have colonated them with plants or animals. So everything had to get out to the islands and then evolve on them. So because these four islands were once one island, they share more species in common with each other because things could move around on the island more easily. They also share more species in common with the mainland because they were much closer. The southern group of islands, these islands, were never attached to the mainland, never attached to one another, and were always further out to sea. So they have less species diversity in general than do the northern channel islands. Another big differentiating factor between these islands is that the northern islands tend to have more fresh water seeps and streams and rivers than do these southern islands. These tend to be much drier. And in fact, this island, Santa Barbara Island right here, it's the smallest island. It's just one square mile of granite. It has absolutely no fresh water on it whatsoever. So everything that lives on this island must survive on rainfall or fog for its freshwater nourishment. Now also, Santa Barbara and then the four northern islands are part of Channel Islands National Park, so they are fairly readily accessible to visitors if you choose to visit them. Catalina, of course, is a tourist destination, but it's still very wild. Don't be fooled by the nice hotels and restaurants. And then San Clemente and San Nicolas are military bases and pretty much off limits to most um, mortals. All right, so with that as a background, let's take a look at these islands. These Channel Islands, let me tell you, they are wild. Harsh. Thrilling. And spoiled. Spoiled in terms of humankind's careless use of them through the introduction of plants and animals such as horses, oops, cattle, sheep, pigs, rats, rabbits, cats, goats, agricultural crops. Now, this is the uh, defunct winery on Santa Cruz Island, and this is the mission, or the little chapel, and I will probably be the first to tell you that I think every island deserves a little wine, but perhaps we shouldn't be growing it on the islands. And then there's incidentally introduced crops as well. Despite this, these islands have remained resilient in their unruly ability to resist domestication, no matter how forcefully we've attempted to enslave them for uses such as ranch lands, big game hunting parks, recreational venues, movie sets, 
and bombing ranges. Some remind me to come back to this slide during the Q&A because it's pretty interesting. Even so, 150 plants and animals either currently make or have made their home, homes on these scraps of lands and nowhere else on the planet. Hence the island's nickname, North America's Galapagos. Now these are some of the animals that live only on the Channel Islands and I don't have time to go through them all, but I'll bring your attention to a few of them. First of all, the Channel Islands fox is just so darn cute. We're gonna have to talk a lot about him in just a moment. And then here, this is the Santa Cruz Island scrub jay or jay. This bird is descended from the mainland jay. It's about 25% larger than the jay that we're familiar with and it's more brightly hued. This is the only endemic bird of the Channel Islands, which means it only lives on the Channel Islands and it only lives on Santa Cruz. Now, I asked an ornithologist not long ago, I said, why doesn't the scrub jay just fly over to Santa Rosa Island? It's right next door. There's lots of good things to eat there. And she just shrugged her shoulders and said, I don't know, but it doesn't. It lives, it stays on Santa Cruz, even though it could easily go elsewhere. Now, this fellow is really, quite fun to know about. This is the Santa Catalina Island ornate shrew. And this shrew is the only shrew on any of the Channel Islands, even though habitats exist on some of the other islands where you'd think the shrew could live, but it doesn't. It only lives in Catalina. It was first collected and first described during the years that the Channel Islands Biological Survey was in full force and effect. And in fact, the mammalogist on the survey, Jack von Blocher Jr., was the one who described this um, little critter in 1940. And what I really think is fun about it is the manner in which Jack got his hands on this little fellow is not what you would have expected. It's quite a cute story. So if you have read the book or haven't read the book and you're going to, I hope you enjoy reading that story as much as I enjoyed learning about it because it was really fun. All right, now this is an example of an animal that's extinct. Both the Columbia mammoth, this big guy, and the pygmy mammoth, the small uh, a mammoth are both extinct. He is about 14 feet high at the shoulders and this guy's about five foot seven. Columbia mammoths lived in North America and they about 20 to 40,000 years ago they swam across the Santa Barbara Channel to inhabit Santa Rosé. And then um, over time some of the young evolved into the pygmy mammoth, this fellow. This was the smallest mammoth in North America and one of the smallest mammoths in the world. But what I think is really interesting about the pygmy mammoth is that it didn't just become a smaller version of the Columbia mammoth. It, it evolved to uh, take advantage of a different ecological niche. And what, what it did was its muscle structure and its bones actually changed shape and form and attachments so that it evolved to have what amounts to four-wheel drive ambulatory abilities. So it could get up very steep island slopes that the Columbia mammoth couldn't reach. And importantly, it could get down those slopes because it had a breaking function. It also evolved to eat different kinds of food. So the two mammoths could coexist very well on the islands. Today, when scientists are looking for mammoth remains, they find Colombian mammoth remains only on the lower grassland areas of the Northern Channel Islands. But the pygmy mammoth remains can be found on high mountaintops, on really steep hillsides and cliffs because it could go everywhere and on, lower, um, on the lower step chundos as well. Okay, I promise we talk about the fox. Here he is, the California, the Channel Islands fox. There are six subspecies of foxes. They're, very, they're distinct and they live on six of the islands. Only the two smallest islands, Santa Barbara and Anacapa, don't have their own special fox. <clears throat> and that's really important too. We'll learn about that in a second. Um, this fox, uh, we believe, was brought over as the mainland gray fox by the Native Americans about 6,000 years ago. And then in about 2,000 years, it took about 2,000 years for it to evolve into its current calendar-worthy self. So it started out as about a 15 to 20 pound animal max. Now it's six pounds, 10 pounds at the very most. It's about the size of a house cat. It's adorable, really adorable. It is the smallest canid in North America and among the smallest dogs in the world. But what I love about this fox is it's, it is the top terrestrial predator. It has a fearless heart. It is not afraid of anything. I can almost guarantee you, if you go to Santa Cruz Island, Scorpion Landing, 
and sit at the picnic benches in the middle of the day. This fox will bring its kits out. It'll walk around. It'll wait for you to throw, you know, leave your picnic table and then scavenge right where you were sitting. It has no fear at all. But what's really amazing is its status as a top terrestrial predator did absolutely nothing to keep this animal from nearly going extinct on all six islands that it lives on in the late 1990s and all due to human related causes. And this happened on all six islands. Now to give you an idea of the magnitude and the dire straits we were in with this critter, in 1994 on Santa Rosa Island alone, it was estimated that there were 1800 foxes living on Santa Rosa Island. By 1999, how many are left? Y'all pick a number. I'm gonna tell you, 15 animals, 15 individual foxes. And the, when scientists first saw this happening, it was really hard for them to figure out what was going on because it was going on on six islands where had different, different things were happening. And as it turned out, I, I'm sorry, I don't have a lot of time to talk about it, but I do cover it in the book pretty, pretty well. But it had to do with DVT poisoning. It had to do with eggshell thinning of the bald eagles. Now, bald, bald eagles are primary fish eaters, but when the bald eagles went away, the golden eagles from Los Padres National Forest came over, and they're meat eaters, and they were feasting on the baby sheep and the baby pigs and the baby goats. Oh, and then when we took off all those animals because they became a national park, what was left? Foxes. So it, it was a really, really, really complicated conservation problem. But luckily for the fox, due to a concerted effort of conservation managers, NGOs, the National Park Service, the US military, private citizens, this fox has recovered on all six islands that it inhabits. And it is currently being monitored to hopefully avoid any such problems in the future. Now, what I want you to take out of this story, besides the fact that this fox is available for you to go look at and see, is that islands are really fragile ecosystems. They evolved in isolation. So when we start mucking around by bringing in you know, new species and taking out species and pesticides or whatever, we can have unintended consequences such as almost losing this amazing animal forever. And remember, they didn't want to do, cap uh, they didn't want to do, you know, breeding of, of the, all the foxes because they're individual subspecies and they are very different. Some have longer vertebrae, some have different colorations. So anyway, we have to be careful on islands. All right, so for you botanists and plant lovers, I wanted to introduce a couple of plants that can only be found on the Channel Islands. This is the Santa Barbara Island Live Forever. It's a Dudleya. It lives on one square mile of land in this entire universe, and that's Santa Barbara. And remember, there's no fresh water on Santa Barbara whatsoever. And uh, the other side of the size spectrum for plants, this is the Tory, uh, Santa Rosa Tory pine. This pine tree is related to the Tory pine in San Diego. It's among the rarest pine trees of the world. Um, and it only lives on Santa Rosa Island in one grove of trees on Santa Rosa Island. But I will say that because it's part of the National Park Service, it's pretty easy to get out to Santa Rosa. There's a beautiful pier here near the old ranch. You can easily get out of the boat and take a nice two mile hike up this beautifully sloping landscape to visit this beautiful grove of trees. And if you're so inclined, I highly recommend you do so. Now, in addition to the indigenous plants and animals on the islands, the islands are important to other species of animals too. And seabirds are a prime example of this. And that's because seabirds are primarily ground nesting birds. So they just sort of sit on the ground, they kind of scoot around and make a little indentation in the ground. Then they lay their eggs, they hatch their eggs, they raise their fledgling, or they, uh, they incubate their eggs, they hatch their eggs, and then they raise their fledgling all on the ground. So you can imagine if there are predators, that's really, really bad for the seabirds. And so, because there were two islands that didn't have foxes, Anacapa and Santa Barbara, those two islands are incredibly important habitats for up to 15 species of seabirds. And once all the um, introduced animals were taken off, the, the seabird populations actually really suffered on those islands. And that caused worldwide declines in their populations. But now we see the animal, the birds are starting to recover and come back. And it's really wonderful to go out to Anacapa or Santa Barbara in the springtime and see the chicks and the, the birds fledging. 
Now, archaeology is also a very important part of the Channel Islands biological uh, Channel Islands story. In fact, the National Park Service deems the sites on the Northern Islands to be among the most valuable in North America, if not the world. Wow. And this sentiment is echoed by a very well-known uh, Channel Islands researcher and archaeologist at the Smithsonian, Tori Rick. And Tori states that the island's archaeological record plays a role in research issues and questions of global significance. That's, those are pretty big statements. So what are those questions of global significance? Well, one of them is the manner in which and the timing of when the islands were first occupied by people, or when North America was first populated. And this is something that the book does delve into quite a bit. Um, it used to be, I'm sure most of us on this um, Zoom talk tonight grew up learning that people first got to North America by walking across the Bering Land Bridge through the ice-free corridor and into North America. And that did happen. That happened about 13,000 years ago. But now, due to an abundance of research and archaeological sites all up and down the North American continent and the South American continent, we now, most archaeologists now believe in a, that there is another way that North America was populated and it probably happened beforehand. And that is called the Pacific Coastal Migration Theory. This theory holds that people with seafaring technologies probably came up the coast of Siberia in boats, crossed the Bering Land Bridge, uh, Bering Sea, and then followed the coastal route down North America, here's the Channel Islands right about here, and then eventually into South, South America. And so they not only had a seafaring te uh, technology, but they had, had the ability to utilize all the marine resources at their disposal. Now this theory is bolstered in large part by a variety of um, archaeological finds on the Channel Islands, and I'll give you two examples of those really important ones. First of all, we have a site on San Miguel Island. This is San Miguel Island here, and this is a, a midden, a kitchen, uh, a shell midden. Shell middens are, if you've not heard that term before, it's a place where people would throw the detritus of their everyday lives. So they might have eaten an abalone. You can see some abalone shells here. They might have eaten the meat of the abalone and then they tossed the shell into a pile. They might have had a mussel. They tossed, you know, ate the mussel, tossed that away. They might have had a broken bowl that they didn't need anymore. So they threw that in that trash hut down. And these items accumulate over time. There's a site on San Miguel Island, it's called Daisy Cave. It's a rock shelter complex that has offered evidence to scientists through carbon dating that people lived on San Miguel Island since at least 12,000 years ago. So if they first come to the middle of the United States around Clovis, New Mexico 13,000 years ago, it's pretty unlikely that they would have made their way all the way to the west coast of, of North America, developed a maritime technology and gotten out to, to San Miguel Island all in 1,000 years. This is the oldest shell midden in North America and it's right there on San Miguel Island. Additionally, there's another really important site and it is here. Now this is um, Santa Rosa Island. And before I tell you about that archeological site, I wanna tell you about this picture. This picture was taken in night, December 1941 by Jack Cofer. Jack Kofer was the youngest member of the Channel Islands Biological Survey. He was 16 years old when he stepped foot on Santa Rosa Island in November of 41. His mother had to write him a permission slip, I saw it. Jack is still alive and he remembers this time very fondly. But he and his buddy, another young man, a 19 year old teenager, were on Santa Rosa Island with the 13th expedition they were here at Tecolote Canyon. Tecolote is either this canyon here or right about here, but they were here digging up mammoth remains. And so Jack took this picture and shared it with me. And this is what I wanna talk about. This right here, this canyon is Arlington Canyon. And if that sounds familiar with you, it might be because you've heard the term Arlington Man. Arlington Man was discovered in the 1950s. There was human remains that um, an archeologist took out of this canyon. He carbon dated them at that time. And they were again carbon dated a few years ago by another uh, archeologist at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. And they are definitively the oldest human remains ever found in North America. They dated to 13,000 years of age. So we have these two sites and a preponderance of sites that were um, 9,000 years older 
that make it lend uh, credence to the Pacific Coastal Migration Theory. So now today, most scientists think, or most archaeologists think, that North America was probably po populated between 14 and 18,000 years ago, and perhaps even longer. Um, and also remember that many of the early coastal sites are underwater because of sea level rise. San Jose and the four northern islands are much smaller. So even now, scientists are looking underwater to try to find earlier sites to give more support to an earlier occupation of the uh, North America. So you can see from all of this that there are lots of really interesting things out there on these Channel Islands. You have plants, you have animals, you have archaeology, you have, you know, um, geology, all this stuff. But nobody had ever attempted the kind of survey that the Channel Islands Biological Survey did. So whose idea was this anyway? Well, credit for that goes to this man, Donald C. Meadows. In 1939, when the Channel Islands Biological Survey was launched, Don Meadows was a 41-year-old high school biology teacher in Long Beach, California. He was a lepidopterist with a personal collection of 20,000 butterflies. And he was a very ambitious man. In fact, at the height of the Great Depression, he left his nice, cushy teaching job to take a leave of absence and go get a master's degree at UC Berkeley. He got that master's degree and he came back to Long Beach with a new goal for himself. He wanted to attain a teaching position in higher education, but he was still in the Long Beach School District. Now there's nothing wrong with that, but he wanted something else. And he realized he was going to have to get his PhD. And he decided that he was gonna do something that had never been done. He was going to do an eight island survey of the Lepidoptera or the butterflies and moths on the Channel Islands. But he realized that this was a pretty big undertaking. So he decided to go talk to this man, John Adams Comstock. Comstock was the director of science at the Natural History Museum of LA County and a Lepidopterist himself. And Comstock was a very wise and skilled and multi-talented man. He was an amazing human being. And he saw merit in Meadows' idea but he saw it as something even bigger. Comstock's idea was that this survey would not just be about insects and butterflies, but it would be multidisciplinary. It would have botany, ornithology, biology, geology, invertebrates, you know, mammalogy, archeology, span every science. He wanted all his scientists to go out there, to go to all eight islands, and he envisioned the fieldwork phase of this survey to be five years long. So for five years, he wanted his scientists to go out there and collect um, specimens. So he expected them to make collections, to bring those collections back into the laboratory for examination and study. He then wanted his scientists to write scientific articles for peer-reviewed presses. Then following that, he wanted them to write articles for the popular press, and then to develop museum displays. So he and Meadows developed a proposal that they presented to the Honorable Board of Governors, which was the governing body of the Natural History Museum, and they reported to the Board of Supervisors of Los Angeles County. And it did have this eight island scope and the multidisciplinary focus, among other um, elements to it. And lo and behold, the Board of Governors approved this survey on Christmas Eve, 1938. But when you think about it, how did that happen? Because the country, this was, you know, nobody had ever done anything like this. This was a huge undertaking, potentially very, very expensive. So how did Comstock ensure that this survey was approved? Well, he did it by including a very shrewd provision. He told the Board of Governors that this survey would cost the museum absolutely nothing over and above the regular staff salaries of the museum scientists involved. That meant that Don Meadows here and his Long Beach buddies, these guys, could come and they could participate, but they would not get paid. It also meant that the scientists themselves had to supply all of their own camping gear. They had to buy their own food. They had to hire a cook if they wanted one, which is really important to have if you're on a field uh, expedition because it's a lot of work. And they had to find their own transportation back and forth to the islands for free or they had to pay for it for themselves. Now this proved the most vexing part of the whole survey, but Comstock managed to develop a couple of really good relationships that did provide free transportation um, whenever the transportation provider could do so, but that was constantly a moving target, so that was always something they had to manage. 
So now I want to introduce you to a couple more of the scientists involved. And we did, um, oh, here they are. They left uh, on their first uh, expedition was in February 1939, and they went to San Clemente Island. All right, so uh, Jack von Blocher, I mentioned, he was the fellow who described the shrew. Now, von Blocher was the mammologist for the survey, and he was actually a bat expert. He was batty for bats. He actually had pet bats. He loved bats. Everywhere he went, he wanted to collect bats. And he was actually a really good field collector. He um, loved to go out in the field, bring things back, um, and then bring them back into the lab and do taxidermy and analysis and then write up pa papers. Jack von Blocher was my favorite character. He was compulsive, he was dark, and he was flawed. Um, he was really fun to learn about. He too was very ambitious, and he had a master's degree from UC Berkeley as well. He studied under Joseph Grinnell. Joseph Grinnell is a very famous California naturalist and the founder of the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology at UC Berkeley. And Grinnell actually encouraged von Blocher to continue his work on the land mammals of Southern California. And that is a goal, getting his PhD and, and writing that seminal work on the land mammals of Southern California's islands were the two things that von Blocher spent the next quarter century pursuing. And I won't spoil it for you completely, but I will tell you he only achieved one of those goals. Now this photo is really important too because, and I'll just spend a minute with it. Um, <clears throat> von Blocher is very, early on an advocate of getting rid of all the non-native uh, animals on the islands. And you can see here, he has two foxes. This is on San Clemente Island. This is a San Clemente fox, and this is a San Clemente Island fox. And in the middle is a tabby cat, stripe, uh, you know, a regular old house cat. But house cats wreak havoc with bird populations, not just on islands, but all over the world. And they were not, they're non-native to the islands. And so they really hurt the bird population and actually the herpetology. So lizards and snakes, oh, there's not a lot of snakes on the islands, but they're really hard on those populations. And in fact, um, the non-native animals, including cats, as I mentioned, were decimating um, San, um, Santa Barbara Island and Anacapa Island. And Van Blocher was writing the National Park Service lots and lots of letters advocating that they get rid of all these non-native animals and bring them back to their pristine sites. And this is an example of what he did there. Now, this is another man that was really important to the survey. This is Art Woodward. Art Woodward was the director of history and anthropology at the Natural History Museum. Um, and he was very different than Meadows and Van Blocher. Art well, Meadows was a man who liked what he liked and let you know what he didn't. He was sort of a rabble arouser. He always stirred things up. He too went to UC Berkeley, but he never graduated. And in fact, he never went back to college. He was still a good archeologist. and He wrote a lot about trade goods and trade patterns on the mainland. Unfortunately, he only wrote a few scientific articles about his time on the Channel Islands, but he did leave um, a wonderful a record of his field notes. And I mined those notes for my book because they added a great amount of color and interest to um, the story, I think. But he is credited with having brought um, a new level of scientific rigor to archeological investigations on the Channel Islands. So he is um, you know, an important person in Channel Islands history. Now, Art had a lot of different research goals. One of his main ones for the Channel Islands was discovering which tribal people occupied the Channel Islands. Was it the Tongva people of the LA Basin, or was it the Chumash people of the northern uh, counties of Santa Barbara and Ventura County? So that was one of the things he was trying to figure out. Every island he, oh, and uh, here on San Clemente Island was the first island, first two islands. They went to San Clemente five times. But Von Blocher was on San Clemente Island, and as I told you, he was batty for bats, so there was a uh, military installation, and Marines were there, so Von Blocher went and chatted up the Marines and said, take me to the bat cave, and they brought him to this cave. They said, this looks like a bat cave, but when they walked inside, instead of finding a cave floor soft with guano and a ceiling squirming with warm drink creatures hanging by their toes, their fingers picked up dry bits of rope and bone and shell, the detritus of a Native American site. 
So they made a huge excavation of this cave. And most amazing was that this cave yielded soft materials that usually disintegrate. Things like they found mission cloth, red, uh, gold and brown cloth, blue and white cloth. They found otter fur. They found a piece of a wooden bow prow that still had a rope attached to it. All these items usually deteriorate over time. But as you can see right here, it was sighted right over the ocean. So the ocean water would splash against the rocks and then impregnate the cave and basically it pickled all of these soft items. And so Woodward made a great collection of items from this cave, which is a really good thing because today San Clemente Island is the only live ship to shore firing range in, uh, for the Navy. And I can tell you from personal experience that they use it like that. And this cave entrance, this cave is now off limits to all military and civilian personnel because, um, oh, it was Big Dog Cave because they found a big dog. <laughs> they named it after the dog. But it's um, off limits to all military and civilian personnel because uh, the cave is, all entrance points to the cave is completely littered with unexploded ordinances and it's too dangerous to try to go back into that cave. So it's nice that we have that collection at the Natural History Museum. Now, as I mentioned, he did have, uh, Woodward did have a very specific things that he wanted to study in every island. And on St. Nicholas Island, he was just completely enamored with the lone woman of St. Nicholas Island. Now, her story, she was a real person who was abandoned on St. Nicholas Island from 1835 to 1853. And her story of resilience uh, was immortalized by Scott O'Dell in his uh, 1960s era uh, book, entitled Island of the Blue Dolphins, which most fourth graders still have to read about. But Woodward wanted to find her whalebone hut. He wanted to find her home. Today, uh, we know so much more about her, the real story. Scott O'Dell's story is fictional, um, but we have found a, a time capsule that was buried there that had some of these items in it. Um, we have, scientists have mined the, um, talked to ancestors of the people who were there. They've mined the various um, mission records to learn much more about her. And we know so much more about her. And one fat, really sad thing is that, um, you know, she lived alone for 18 years, or actually she probably had a small son, the, a son that lived with her. And then we, they think that perhaps the son was killed in a shark accident because she mined, you know, big teeth when she was on, on Santa Barbara. But she lived alone for 18 years, came to the mainland, with um, George Nidever, the sea captain, and she died seven weeks later. So that's really a sad story. But Woodward wanted to find her whalebone hut. So he took the sea captain's um, diary or, or his memoir, and he followed every footstep the sea captain made to find her house. And he found this 19 whale bones right here, and he believed this was her whalebone hut. And he was so sure that it was her whalebone hut that on a later trip, he actually resurrected the hut, and then he sat a, uh, dark haired, short archeological, female archeological assistant inside the hut and he took photographs of her um, from the back as though that was her hut. Scientists today don't think that was really her hut but they found out so much more about her. It's really, really great. All right, now really quickly, um, we're almost ready to wrap up here but I do wanna talk about the composition of the Channel Islands Biological Survey members. There were 32 members. As I mentioned, um, we had citizen scientists like uh, uh, Don Meadows and his Long Beach buddies. We had um, an immigrant here. This is George Kanikoff. George was the museum's invertebrate specialist, and he was actually an immigrant from Russia. He came to the United States when he was 26 years old. They were teenagers. There was Jack Kofer and Harry Fletcher, and um, this, this fellow, I think this is John Schrader. He was 19 as well. And there were women. Here we have Ona Van Bloker. Ona, is, Ona was Jack's wife. Um, she served as her husband's uh, field assistant and camp cook, unpaid, of course. And she actually logged more time on the Channel Islands than many of the researchers. So I actually give her a lot of credit. And then there was this woman right here. This is um, Marion Hollenbach. And Marion Hollenbach, along with one other uh, female archaeologist, participated on the Channel Islands Biological Survey. And they were the first two trained female archaeologists to ever work on the Channel Islands. So all in all, I think it's a pretty diverse group and rather ahead of its time, given all of the differences um, in the people. All right. Expedition number 13 was to Santa Rosa Island. It was the second expedition to this um, island, and there were two camps. One was here, uh, Camp Nidever near the old ranch house, 
and then the other was up here at Tecolote Canyon. The teenagers were here, as I mentioned, they were trying to get to this elephant camp. They were trying to find mammoth bones, and you can see it's very close to Arlington Canyon, so that's why Jack had the opportunity to make that photograph. At any rate, Jack and Harry Fletcher were on a very steep slope excavating these beautiful mammoth jawbones when the vaqueros rode up in the fog on the morning on December 7th, 1941. It was Jack's 17th birthday and they said, Pearl Harbor's been bombed, the West Coast has been completely blacked out, ship traffic has stopped, we're not allowed to use our radio communications, we don't know when or how you're gonna get back to the mainland, but you guys gotta pack up and go back to the main camp in case you get rescued somehow. So that's exactly what they did. They didn't know how they were gonna get off of this island. Leave it to John Adams Comstock to somehow commandeer this boat. This is the schooner Santa Cruz. It's a cattle boat. It's how they got the cattle back and forth between the mainland and the islands. He got the schooner Santa Cruz to go out and pick up his staff, bring them safely back to the mainland one day later than originally planned. But that was effectively the end of the Channel Islands Biological Survey, cut short by war. They did go to all eight islands. It was multidisciplinary. Um, and at least 49 scholarly articles were produced from this um, survey. And that is the end. I thank you all very, very much for your attention. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. That was absolutely <laughs> wonderful. I'm gonna go ahead and unmute Ricardo as well. You're all asking to unmute, so. Oh my gosh, it's so funny because um, having, you know, participate in a few excavations, I feel like the dinner or lunch scene is, has literally not changed. It still looks yeah. the same. It's, you know, it's kind of some desperate faces huddled around a little makeshift table with a hot beverage. It's, you but know, I still it's love that they had a tablecloth and, you know, it was just all so civilized. I, I loved it. <laughs> it is really hard work, like you mentioned. So I think it is definitely good to like take that moment. Um, you know, to relax and do something wonderful. So, yeah. oh my gosh. So everyone go ahead and submit some questions through the Q&A if we have any questions. Um, let's see. First question from Pratik. Hi Pratik, hi Roseanne. Hope you guys are doing well. I heard that the Palace Verdes Peninsula was once an island. Is this true? Any relation to the Channel Islands? Okay, um, I have heard that too. I. I from my old days as a whale watch volunteer, yes, I would say that um, San Pete, uh, the Palace Ridge Peninsula was once an island. There once were many, many, many islands out there, but then when sea level rose, um, it subsumed many of those islands. And there was a lot of plate tectonics and you know uplifting, and so eventually, um, um, you know, Palace Verdes did become attached to the mainland. But I think that was because of uplifting, whereas a lot of the other islands were subsumed and we were left with the eight channel islands, plus a couple rocks, <laughs> big rocks, and teal rock, things like that. Okay, so um, let's see, Mark, hi Mark, is asking why and when did the shoreline change? All right, Santa Rosa Island began breaking up, I think it was about 13,000 years ago because of the ice age melting. So the ice age melted, sea levels rose and subsumed the lower, um, you know, lower level landscapes. And by 9,000 years ago, that was when the last of the four islands was, um, became separate amongst themselves. And if you go there, you can still see, especially San Miguel and Santa Rosa, it's like they're stretching out to reach each other. You can see, they, were, they look like, you know, you know how North America and Africa look or South America and Africa look like they were once one, one you know just the geographic contours but it's sort of like that still oh wow that's really amazing um and changing sea levels is still something we're working on today right yes, it is. and actually on that subject um this is a great question um is plastic pollution an issue on the island today or even in the past um few decades and what other issues are currently um what other issues is the island facing currently as far as um, our environmentally speaking? Wow, that's a great question. Um, of course, plastic pollution is a problem because it's plastics in our oceans and that gets into our food, um, you know, our, our food chain because it, it gets eaten by other animals. Um, you know, the National Park Service has done a great job of bringing the islands back to their native state. It's not perfect, but they have gotten rid of all of the um, non-native animals. 
plants are not a problem. We have fennel has almost completely taken over, or in many places taken over Santa Cruz Island. So that, and you even have eucalyptus on, um, on Santa Cruz. They brought them out there, but those are not native to those islands. So it's sort of a debate. Do we want to get rid of the eucalyptus? They've been there for 200 years. You know, at what point, you know, actually foxes might have not been part of it. You know, do you hear them? No, we're not going to get rid of foxes. <laughs> Um, so I would say that, uh, you know, on the, on the Northern Channel Islands, on the, in the Channel Islands National Park, people can visit, but you have to bring everything in and take everything out. There's no water, fresh water services. You have to bring all your own fresh water in. If you camp, you have to hike, you know, camp it out. So those islands, they work really, really hard to keep pristine. Catalina, you know, Catalina is a special island. Um, it's wonderful. It's sort of the ambassador because people can go visit, they can hike. It's still really rugged island. You can have a really great island rugged wildlife experience, but then sleep in a nice bed and have a nice meal um, and at the end of the day. So they have to balance a lot more on Catalina Island, I would say. And then you've got Clemente and Nicholas, which are military bases. And you know, they are being used for military purposes. And I just wanna just wanna moderate that moderate that a little bit because parts of the islands are used for military or heavily used, but parts of the islands are completely off limits and they're very, very, very pristine. Just as on the mainland, you know, you have these large military installations, Camp Pendleton, Vandenberg, Point Hanini, those swaths of land are incredibly important to the wildlife. They serve as flyover areas. There's a lot of wildlife that live on them. So the Navy does, the military does use these properties and they, you know, you might, people can say they abuse them, but they also preserve big parts of them and they participate heavily um, in preservation efforts as well. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Um, I keep thinking about um, when you were talking about uh, Jack von Bloker, correct? Um, yeah. That he was your favorite character. I was like, what an amazing, how many other people were actually actively trying to look at invasive species and their damage on environments during that time? Um, well, I don't, I don't know. I don't know for sure. But, um, you know, he did talk. I have these wonderful letters that he wrote to the soil conservation person. And um, I think that people were really, they were aware that this was a problem, but they didn't know what to do about it. It was really hard. And Jack actually said, we need to get, uh, we need to use rodenticide on Anacapa and get rid of all the rats. And he said, that's going to hurt the bird population because they're going to eat it too in the short run. But when they come back, you know, as they fly away, the ones that are living still, and they'll come back, there won't be any rats there. So, and that's actually what happened. And on Santa Cruz, it was really interesting. Um, one of the last animals to be taken off of Santa Cruz Island were pigs, wild boars. They, pigs, you know, become boars very quickly. They were brought over there as uh, game animals, I think. And on, actually on Santa Rosa Island, they were game animals too. But um, the pigs were really hard to get rid of because they hide. It's incredibly mountainous. When I say these islands are harsh, they are really harsh landscapes. The San Ynez Mountains are harsh, but oh my gosh, Santa Cruz is a huge island. And um, they actually had to bring out New Zealand sharpshooters and they made fences and they would fence off an area and then get rid of all the pigs in that area and then they would go to the next fence because otherwise they would just keep multiplying and changing so it's something oh my gosh so um let's see we have another question will deer ever be removed from catalina are they on any of the other channel islands so are, I, okay i don't actually know if deer are still on the island or is this person saying they are maybe that person can talk um, more not, maybe. not sure um let's see but they might be, and buffalo are. Now, the buffalo were brought over in the 1910s. Let's see, did Mark write something back? The buffaloes uh, were brought over as part of a movie shoot in 1919 or something like that. It was a Zane Gray movie. They brought over about 10 animals. And at the end of the filming, the industry executives felt it was too expensive to take them back off the island, so they just left them. And they grew into a herd of about 500 buffalo. That many, that's amazing. Yes, and I remember going over to Santa Catalina Island, taking a tour up to Airport in the Sky. There's a little cafe there and having a buffalo burger, which for me was very exotic because I grew up back east. And uh, they still serve buffalo burger, but it was one of the areas where they, you know, they were culling the, the animals because they were taking over. And now they manage the herd to about 120 animals. And actually buffalo are much, 
gentler to the ground than say cows. They, they are, they don't emit as much gases and they don't eat and ruin the, the landscape as much as yeah. cows. That's true. Um, I, I mean, even just um, if, if anybody's ever been to the Big Bear Alpine Zoo, they had two, um, I think, I don't know if they were, I think they were buffalo that were left there after a film shoot as well, um, <laughs> that ended up kind of becoming a part of the zoo family. So Mark said that he heard that um, the deer are still hunted on Catalina. Um, uh, so I, I did because they are indigenous to the state, unlike goats that were removed. Okay, say that last part again. I'm sorry. Uh, removal of the deer is restricted because they are indigenous to the state, oh. unlike goats that were removed. That's interesting. Yeah, that's definitely something we can all kind of like follow up with and check out. So yeah. um, I'm right. betting Mark has an article he can send me. Mark, you have my email. <laughs> send it to me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So actually, just to shift gears a little bit, where can, oh, Ricardo, do you know something about oh, the Oh, I was just going to ask uh, Corrine. Are there current uh, archaeologic studies going on or plans for, you know, more explorations um, in, in the future, either now or in the future? Yes, there are ongoing investigations from all the sciences. You know, islands are really important to conservation because it's, islands present a unique ability for conservation managers to try things out because you can control the environment better than on the mainland. And so islands are sort of called, you know, laboratories of evolution. You can really work with islands. All the sciences are really out on the islands. There's lots of, you know, uh, work being done on the lizards and herpetology, on the archaeology. I mean, every week there's a field station on Santa Cruz Island that's used very much. There's another field station on um, Santa Cruz Island. It's UC, the UC uh, Santa Barbara's field station. Santa Rosa Island has the Cal State Channel Islands. Um, field station. People go out to these islands. Scientists are out on these islands all the time. There's wonderful work being done. And as I mentioned, they're now doing underwater work as well. And that's a huge project um, and really exciting, really exciting work. And there, oh, there's a, there's actually a, um, if y'all are interested, there's actually a, every four years, there's a Channel Island Symposium and it's a scientific symposium. It's in Ventura. It's at the Marriott right off, you know, the 101 freeway and you can sign up and you know you have to pay to go in but you can listen to all these scientists talk about what's going on and it's so much fun to go to <laughs> wow that's amazing what an amazing like opportunity for such like an interdisciplinary study um right. very cool so question i know ricardo and i had said that we especially liked the mammoths but this is a great question and a good plug for nhm on where can the small mammoth bones be viewed are they in the museum which actually I was curious if the bones they excavated from the island, if they did go to Natural History Museum or if they went somewhere else. No, uh, well, all the, um, all the items that they took from the Channel Islands Biological Survey are in the Natural History Museum, although sometimes things were deposited elsewhere, like the prototype mouse might be at the Smithsonian or might have been gone to Berkeley's museum or something like that. But um, the prototype pygmy mammoth the first pygmy mammoth ever found was found on the Channel Islands, of course, and it's in the Natural History Museum of LA County. Also, if you go to La Brea Tar Pits, which is undergoing a huge renovation, you can see pygmy mammoth bones there. And also at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History, there um, are wonderful exhibits. They've actually, a few years ago, they found at what's called an intermediate mammoth. So you had the Columbia mammoths, and then you had the pygmy mammoths, but they found one middle-sized one. So it was part of the evolutionary. And I think that's at, I think that's actually in North Dakota, because the guy, there's a mammoth center in North Dakota, and he would go out to the Channel Islands. That's really amazing. But lots of research going on. Yeah, absolutely. I always recommend uh, La Brea Tar Pits Museum to everybody. It's a really amazing site. Um, if your kids aren't going there on a field trip, take them there. Um, and it's amazing that how many um, uh, fossils they found related to the Ice Age just in their work trying to build the Metro line. Um, oh, yeah, right. Lots of sloth right. pelvises and yeah. cool stuff like that. So. All right, so Corinne, I'm curious if Franz Lanting's Island of the West from Baja to Vancouver was part of your research bibliography. I'm embarrassed to say I don't know that. Oh well, my gosh, that's a good one. Okay, send that, that to that down. Down. Well, yeah. Yeah, let's see, what's it called? Uh, from Baja to Vancouver. Okay. Yes, Islands of the West from Baja to 
Vancouver. Patrick, send the link to um, our museum email so that we can forward that. It'll be another good thing to follow up on. Thank so, you. Ricardo, did you have something to add? Oh, I was just going to ask um, for those who want to go beyond Catalina, uh, I'm sure there's some, uh, what do you recommend? Um, which island and what type of a journey do you think is best for uh, somebody just wants to see see more and, and learn more right right well you know it really depends on the individual's uh, outdoorsiness i guess because really on the the, the five channel islands that are part of channel islands national park are serviced by uh, island packers which is out of oxnard and also ventura so I'll write that down island packers they run trips out to these islands so you could do a day trip like Anacapa is really easy to do. Anacapa is tiny. It's one square mile. That one island is one square mile. The tr trick about Anacapa is the boat never docks. You have to kind of jump up onto the dock. And then there's 157 steps you have to walk up. And remember, you have to bring your water and your food. But once you get up there, it's flat and you get to see the, the western gull um, nests there. And it is so beautiful to see these. These are big birds. They have 57 inch wingspans. We don't think about that. We see them here, we call them dump ducks. On Anacapa Island, they are amazingly beautiful. They all face the same direction. They're sitting on the ground, they've got their eggs, they've got their nests, and every one of them is facing the same direction. And they're facing into the wind. So the wind blows back against their feathers and they don't, you know, friend the feathers. And the wind changes, they all change. And so Anacapa is pretty easy to get to. It's a short boat ride, a short, you know, you can do that in a day trip. But um, Santa Cruz Island and Santa Rosa Island are, now Santa Cruz is considered the jewel of the, of the chain. It's the largest, but the park service is only on um, about uh, 15 to 20% of the island. And it's that Scorpion Anchorage. And right now the pier is closed, but I, still, I think you can still get on the island. Oh, there's something it's, really special about seabirds. They're quite amazing to watch in the oh, wild right but santa rosa is gorgeous and there's lots of hiking and canyons and there's still one horse out there they left that was a big ranch the Van vickers ranch and when they that was the last island ranch in north america mm. uh, or you know, in the united states uh, the continental united states and they left a legacy herd of horses out there and they're visited by a vet regularly and there's one horse left i didn't get to see the horse but it's still there mm. it's just a beautiful island so i would go to probably again you know if you got a camp go to santa cruz or santa rosa for sure um since and, and, and if uh, the only way you can get to Santa Barbara Island, which is a wonderful island, it's small, but you have to take a dive boat out and you either stay overnight on the dive boat or you can camp on the island, but that's a, a weekend trip or you can take a private boat. Like if you mm. hire a private boat, you can go out. They're just, they're all wonderful. Any, and San Miguel, people love San Miguel. San Miguel once was totally windswept and it still is. It's sort of this wild island, you know, it's, it's the northernmost island. The winds come down from Point Conception, they just rage, but you've got the Kalishi Forest there, which is this amazing, you know, I showed one picture of the Kalishi Forest. Um, it's just this great landscape, but it's a long day trip. There's one trip a year, I think, that's a day trip, because you go out, it's like a five-hour boat ride. You spend about five hours on the island, and then you have a five-hour boat ride home. It's a wow. long day. Wow, that is. Actually, um, Bensi and Moira are, are typed in that um, they stayed overnight once with the UCSC Alumni Association at the UCSC Study Station on San Francisco, and that was a really fabulous experience. It really is. I've, I've gotten to do that a couple times, too. Yeah. So another, we've got a few more questions here. I think we actually have seven questions. So are there any particular bird and animal species protected on the various islands? Oh, yes, there are. <laughs> I'd imagine probably most of them. <laughs> yes. Um, well, on Santa, on Anacapa Island, there uh, it's the only it's it's a major roosting area for the California brown pelican, and it's that it, it's not on the um, furthest east island. It's on one of the small islets, and it's completely off limits to visitors. Only park scientists and scientists can go there. And then on um, San uh, and on Santa Barbara Island, you've got really important um, nesting habitats for the uh, Scripps murrelet, 
and for the storm petrels and actually another thing that's happening on Santa Barbara Island that's really exciting is there's a little island offshore called Sutil and they're finding that the brown booby is migrating up from tropical waters because of the changing ocean conditions and then now brown boobies are inhabiting and nesting and raising chicks on Sutil Island. So that island, if you go to it, is, especially in the spring, uh, is really wonderful to see these really rare seaboards. And then also pinnipeds really rely on um, the Channel Islands. Pinnipeds are seals and sea lions, and there's stellar sea lions, Guadalupe fur, fur seals. There's a number of species of sea lions. I used to have a slide, but we didn't have time to do that. But on one, island, one beach on San Miguel Island alone, it's called Symington Beach, it's estimated that 100,000 pinnipeds haul out to breed on that island throughout the year, on that one beach. On San Nicolas Island, which is the military base, it's a really important rookery for elephant seals, northern elephant seals. Now you can see the elephant seals on Cambria. I don't know if you all have ever done that in San Simeon. You know how proud that is. But on the Channel Islands, the, the seals and sea lions are much shyer. They aren't used to people there. Mm -hmm. They get these beaches to themselves. Nobody bothers them. And it really is important. In fact, I went out, I can't even remember when it was, but there was a stellar sea lion on the buoy outside of Ventura Harbor, and that's a really rare sighting. So stellar sea lions are coming back. The sea otters really use, um, you know, occasionally will use these islands as well. So they are important to wildlife. You keep saying stellar, and I keep thinking of the um, the stellar sea cow, which was this that was that manatee like creature. Yeah. Well, Stellar was a scientist who found all these different animals. Okay, that's the connection. And one of them, yeah. <laughs> that's very cool. So, do you still actually visit the islands? Um, how often do you go? Um, let's see, Patrick Pratchick was asking, uh, what's your favorite thing about them? And uh, thank you for this. It's been so interesting. <laughs> thank you very much, Patrick. I do still go. I love them. I'm associate, uh, I am an associate of the uh, Santa Cruz Island Foundation, which is a great privilege and every year I go out to the channel I go out to Santa Cruz Island on the um, the, uh, the Nature Conservancy owns the bulk of Santa Cruz Island it was left to them by the own island owner and um, that's where that little chapel is and it's an incredibly beautiful chapel there's a beautiful ranch house with a swimming pool there the old winery buildings and every year on May 3rd, they celebrate the Feast of the Holy Cross uh, in this chapel. And they bring out the Monsignor from Los Angeles, Ventura. Uh, Joe Walsh is the president of that association. He sings and plays guitar in the chapel for, you know, 150 people. And we have a picnic and barbecue, and it's really fun. <laughs> well, that's so amazing. I still go out there. Yeah. That's very cool. Okay, so Carol is asking, she must be in the other room from Ricardo. Um, are the Tongva or Chumash doing any research? Are they involved in any projects um, that are happening on the islands currently? Well, I'm, um, I'm not an expert in this field, but um, I know on Catalina Island, there are the Pimu people, which were, Catalina was the, uh, is Tongva, but they specifically were called Pimu, and there is an organization, a Pimu organization, and they are doing ongoing research on the Channel Islands. Catalina also is the island that has the most found, if you will, rock art that we know of. And so there's a lot of research about that on those islands as well. That's really neat. Um, definitely something that we can look into as well. Okay, so a question from Robert. Did I understand that North America was first inhabited by humans on the West Coast? Did they migrate east? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yes. Okay, and then let's see. Mark is also asking, I've seen an abalone decline in Palisades and Catalina. Um, I think we have all seen that, um, especially um, at least in my parents' lifetime. There used to be so many out there. Um, is it recovering on any of the Channel Islands? Um, that, that's actually a good question. I, I, I hesitate to answer that question because I don't really know. There's a wonderful book called, um, I have it in my bookcase it's called uh, celestial empire and it's all about the abalone industry and the chinese fishermen it used to be used you know today the decline in the abalone is called uh, is caused by abalone waste sea star wa wasting disease abalone wasting disease it's something that does something to the foot of the abalone so it can't hold on to the rock anymore but it used to be that people thought that the chinese abalone fishery caused the demise in the um 
abalone population, populations, and research has proven that that's not the case. So we can't blame it on them, but there was a lot of you know, discrimination going on. Um, but I don't know the status of the abalones now. Yeah, I know there's a lot of research. I know um, Surfrider is involved in a few projects, um, and there was a, an amazing article in the um, LA Times some early, I think late last year that um, had this full page flow chart of all the abalone and I had no idea there were so many different kinds. Um, I think there were like 14 different species and that's probably not correct but um, there were quite a few so it's definitely I think that's like an ongoing thing definitely. All right so this is actually a really great question for us to end on. Thank you Cedric. Do you have a preferred method to purchase your book? I know we had two ways on our website, so it's right. a great plug for your fabulous publication. Yes, please go to the University of Utah Press um, website and Google my, you know, the uh, Google my title, and the, I'm, I'm typing this up for you all too. And then you want to enter the hard copy book and the ebook. And type in this code, virtual, V-I-R-T-U-A-L-I-S-L-A-N-D-S, -S, um, when you check out, and you'll receive both the, the hard copy book and the e-copy, and um, free shipping for the price of the hard copy book. So you'll, you know, you can start reading it and getting, um, getting into it by virtual book, an e-copy book, and then you can keep the hard copy book, I'll sign it for you, or go to Pages, you know, please visit Pages. Um, and the other thing I just want to offer to all of you all is if you have a book club of, say, five or more people, and you'd like to do a book club with the author, I'd love to do that with you all. So you can reach me on my website. I'm going to, um, let's see, how can I how can I write my website for everybody here? Well, it's pretty easy. It's www. and then it's um, Channel Islands, California, all cap or all lowercase, all one word, channelislandscalifornia.com. And you can reach me through uh, that. Um, here, I'll type my answer. Perfect. I will add that link onto our website too. Um, and you folks, if you definitely want to go ahead and check out her book, I'm going to leave all that information on where you can find it and the cool discount code and everything up on our website. So definitely check that out, guys. It's a fabulous book. I am in the middle of it and um, going to sneak off and probably read in a little bit. So I don't see any other questions aside from thank you, Mark. Really enjoyed this. Thank you. Thank you all so time. much. Thank you. Thank yes. You and thank you, Ricardo, for being my co-host. I really appreciate it. If you're a board member and you're tuned in, you will be asked to be a co-host for a presentation very soon. No one is getting off easy. <laughs> well, go Hermosa Beach. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. If anybody has any other last minute questions they think of, feel free to email the museum. Please support the museum. Let's support Corinne and her book. And thank you, everybody. I'm going to click the end button. I think that means everybody's going to get booted off. So um, very serious business. So thank you and have a wonderful evening. Everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you. <laughs>